Henges are one of the most significant ancient structures. There are lots of them in the British Isles, and as with many Neolithic monuments, what their exact function was isn't really known. Unlike long barrows, dolmens, and passage tombs, they do not appear to have been funerary architecture. That said, since many henges were contemporary with nearby burial monuments, it's possible that they may have played a role in some sort of funerary procession as part of a larger ritual landscape. Stonehenge is probably the most famous henge in the world. In fact, the word henge is derived from the name Stonehenge. However, Stonehenge isn't strictly speaking a henge. More on that later. In this video, I'm talking henges. What is one? What isn't one? What are the different types? What might they have been used for? And which are the most brilliant examples? Lots of research has gone into defining and categorizing henges, as well as listing features associated with them, such as curses, pits, platforms, and pottery. Experts have produced very detailed work on this, and looking at the data, it's pretty hard to make generalizations. That said, I'll do my best to summarize the main types of henge and some of the most noteworthy characteristics of them. Broadly speaking, a henge or henge monument is a Neolithic earthwork made up of a circular bank and a ring dish which sits inside the bank. The central area of a henge has to be more than 20 meters in diameter for it to be classified as such. Much of these earthworks have been plowed out over the years. However, archaeologists are able to identify them from crop marks seen in aerial photography and on satellite images. Sometimes multiple banks and ditches exist within the same henge. Because the bank sits on the outside of the ditch, henges are not thought to have been defensive structures because otherwise you would expect the ditch to be outside the bank like a moat on a medieval castle, unless it was designed to keep something in rather than to keep something out, of course. Mostly henges have no evidence of burials or domestic dwellings within them. However, some of them once had or still have structures in their center, such as megalithic stone circles or wooden posts. Many others were and still are completely empty though. Henges are further classified as class one if they have one entrance, which appears as a gap in the earthen bank, class two if they have two entrances opposite one another, and class three if they have four entrances forming two opposing pairs. The Thornborough henges in Yorkshire, England are good examples of henges which are empty. Here you can see them on an ordnance survey map. Shout out to Paul and Rebecca Whitewick's channel where I discovered that you can access digital ordnance survey maps on Bing. I didn't know this until last week, so I registered for a media license to use the images in this video. I love ordnance survey maps when looking at UK sites. They're really useful. So these three henges each have a diameter of 240 meters and are 550 meters apart from each other. As you can see, they are aligned northwest to southeast, but with a slight deviation, which some researchers think is meant to mirror Orion's belt, just as the Giza pyramids in Egypt appear to. Each of the three henges has two opposing entrances. Now, what's interesting is a 44 meter wide cursus once ran for more than a kilometer with an east-west alignment from Thornborough village to the River Yore via the central hen. A cursus is an avenue with ditches on either side which runs for many kilometers and is usually enclosed on each end by an earthen bank. Many Neolithic structures are associated with one or more cursuses. What's interesting about the Thornborough cursus is that it probably predates the henges. So this is another important thing to mention. Henges may well be part of wider ritualistic landscapes, so shouldn't be looked at in isolation. But these landscapes may also have been in use for extensive periods of time, with the addition and adaptation of various monuments over thousands of years. In fact, close to Thornborough, there are other Neolithic monuments, as well as pits that are thought to date to the Mesolithic. Of course, we expect settlements to recur in the same places over many different time periods, 
due to the availability of resources. But for ritualistic or ceremonial monuments to have been repeatedly erected in the same area over many generations, there must have been something specific about the landscape that continued to attract this monumental activity. In an interesting PhD thesis I read, which is linked below, the researcher plotted the henges of the British Isles on a map and noticed that they mostly occur in lowland areas and close to water sources. Actually, there's quite a bit of evidence for the ditches in henges having contained water when they were in use. So the characteristics of the landscape were likely crucial to the function of the henges, just as settlements tend to be located near rivers and fertile agricultural land. Let's look at another example of empty henges. The Knowlton Circles in Dorset are made up of three henges and a squarish enclosure. Although they did not contain standing stones, one of the henges didn't remain empty. The earthwork known as Church Henge was reused in later periods, firstly for an Anglo-Saxon cemetery and then for the construction of a Christian church in the 12th century. There are many round barrows close to the Knowlton Circles, as well as the remains of the Dorset Cursus, which would have stretched over a distance of more than 10 kilometers during the Neolithic. So once again, we have a landscape littered with henges and Neolithic monuments. There are much less examples of stone circles within henges than there are empty henges. The largest examples are Stonehenge, Avebury, the Ring of Broggar, the Standing Stones of Stennis, and Stanton Drew. Technically speaking, Stonehenge isn't actually a henge because the ditch is outside the earthen bank rather than the other way around, which is typical. The Ring of Broggar is also irregular since it has a ditch but no earthen bank. Today, nothing resembling a henge can be seen surrounding the standing stones of Stennis. However, archaeologists have found evidence that a ditch and bank once encircled the monument. Interestingly, Avebury is classed as a superhenge. Superhenges, also known as henge enclosures, are massive henges with a diameter of more than 300 meters and which often have evidence for domestic occupation as well as ritual activity within them. Although in the case of Avebury, there is no evidence for domestic activity having taken place there. As with many henges, Avebury is part of a landscape packed full of Neolithic and Bronze Age monuments and there's some evidence the area may have held ritual significance as far back as the Mesolithic. But, in spite of its huge size, Avery is not the largest henge in the British Isles. The largest one is known as Marden Henge or the Hatfield Earthworks. It's made up of an oval henge measuring 530 metres in diameter, which encloses a second henge and a mound. During excavations, archaeologists found evidence for pottery, flint, animal bone and timber building. The Marden Henge sits between Stonehenge and Avebury, which makes me wonder about the size of ritual landscapes. Perhaps we ought to consider much larger areas as being part of ceremonial pilgrimages. When henges have a central section with a small diameter of between 5 and 20 metres, they are referred to as hengiform monuments. Warmy Hillock Henge in Scotland is an example of this, although the term hengiform sometimes also refers to monuments that are similar to henges but aren't quite henges, rather than simply meaning small versions of them. Although the function of henges isn't known with any certainty, the way they, along with the cursuses, are demarcated suggests a delineation between the sacred and the profane. Clearly, access was limited in some way. It's likely they were used for some sort of rituals and ceremonies, although what these were, when they took place within the year, and how long they lasted is debatable. They may have been connected with the seasons or particular life events. Pottery found in ditches and animal bones discovered in and around henges suggest votive offerings were made and ritual feasting took place at them. There's also a question of astronomical alignments. Some henges appear to be aligned with the solstices and equinoxes, especially those containing standing stones. Perhaps this was so that rituals could be timed accurately or because certain ceremonies were intimately connected with the passing of the seasons. I personally think that the Neolithic inhabitants of Britain practiced an early form of the later sky-earth cosmology that dominated ancient Egypt, not necessarily because these cultures were connected in any way, but because the life-giving attributes of the sun and of water were extremely important to survival, which led people to 
deify them and attempt to control their influence through magic and ritual. I also think ancestor worship was probably very important, which is why burial monuments were created and why the same landscapes remained focal points for ritual activity for thousands of years. I hope you enjoyed this video. Please hit the like button, subscribe if you don't already, and I'll see you next time.